Go ahead. So, hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I wonder whether I should actually be concerned or flattered that there are so many, there's such a, an enormous attendance at this late hour of the day. But, <laughs> yeah. but that's great because then you can all uh, that you can all help us to to triage system debug. So please pay attention. So SystemD provides a range of tools to debug and shut down problems and failing services and also to optimize boot times. And while everything is uh, documented quite well, I think uh, it actually makes sense to see how these tools would look in action and if you actually encounter a, sy uh, a situation where your boot doesn't work. And I want to show you the first steps and the tools that you can use to dissect uh, the problem, how to get to the root of it. And the idea is that this was supposed to be an interactive bot. So I show like a particular scenario and hack around a little bit, show you the tools, and please never hesitate to ask questions to that scenario. Or if you want to know some details about this, or what if this thing would look a little different, and so on. And I have prepared a couple of scenarios and we just keep on walking through them until we either run out of time or out of club mate or let's see. <laughs> so let's first start with a relatively clean uh, Debian installation from like two weeks ago, I think, when I prepared this VM. Uh, this is an XFC uh, LXC installation. So you see uh, the boot is relatively clean. We boot with quiet, so there are no messages, and it's reasonably fast. So this is the, the, the situation that we expect. No, lang no long hangs and so on. And LXDE doesn't have a shortcut for increasing the font size. Sad. <laughs> so I think this should be moderately reasonable, uh, readable now. The first, sorry? Still not? So, how is that? <laughs> what? Martin? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe I don't make that full screen, but almost full screen so that we see the first character. Oh. That's all about a system debug. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. So the first feature that I want to, to show is the journal. So system decentralizes all logging that goes on in the system into the so-called journal. And you should think about it as a kind of a log database. So it's not just a simple text file, unlike the, the old var log syslog, but it is actually a full database which you can query, index, you can format it as you like, and uh, so which makes it very nice to debug problems with particular units or particular time spans and so on. If you just look at the journal without any other options, it pretty much looks like Valdox's well, log. So it is formatted for in exactly the same way for backwards compatibility reasons. So if you want, you can just uninstall our syslog and, uh, and, and use the journal instead and all the parsing tools, etc., should go along with that just fine except that it contains a lot more than the usual RSS log. In particular, it contains all the kernel messages, and then which is what is particularly useful is that it also contains all the daemons standard out and standard error. Unless, of course, they redirect their output to dev null, but most daemons don't. So you can see pretty well what's going on in the system. So the full journal is quite a bit of a mouthful, of course. So if we want to look at what's going on in a particular, uh, with a particular service like DBAS, we can say that too. With dash u, we can give it a particular unit name, like DBAS service. We don't actually need to type the service, but made it, maybe it's a little less confusing. And then you only see the logs that DBAS generated. And you see it's not just the logs, it's also uh, standard output from the daemon, which is quite nice. And not only that, you can also filter by, by, by like a, by like a, 
what is this message priority? So you can say, don't give me the full syslog, but only give me all messages that are at least warning. So you can say priority, warning, and then you, if you want to debug what's wrong with the system, you, you only really get the, the important bits and not all the, uh, the techno babble from the kernel, which, uh, which, uh, like which hardware it detects and so on. But you can walk through the warnings and error messages, which gives you a much better idea what goes on with the system. And in this particular case, the errors are marked in red, so it's even easier to, to spot them. <coughs> Another uh, useful thing is to, to only show messages which uh, belong to a particular user. As I said, everything in, in the systemd system is locked into the journal, including the user sessions. So I could also say, give me everything that is relevant to my Martin user here. And I get that. So there's a couple of systemd messages here, which might be confusing, but please take into account that the session is also maintained. Like every user has its own systemd uh, instance, which you can use to manage your session in pretty much the same way as you would manage the whole system. So you see it's not system D pit one here, but it's pit 443. <coughs> so you can, can use it to figure out uh, like error messages from its say DBFS or whatever goes on here. And you see these dash dash reboot lines here, which uh, show you yeah, like the boundaries between different reboots. And a useful thing to do is to restrict the, the output to the current boot only. Then you, you don't get all the bits that don't really, that aren't relevant to the current boot. So you see this was the boot from. I mean, you have to add here that that's only working if you enable persistent journal. And I think you didn't mention that yet. And no, because yeah. the, the current boot al always works. <laughs> sure. So that's locked into run by default. So in Debian, we, we only, we don't enable persistent boot, uh, persistent journaling. That is logging to var uh, log, log journal, var log journal. Uh, because we install our syslog by default, and so we didn't want to lock the same stuff into two different places because it's just a waste. But you can enable uh, persistent journal by pretty much just creating the var log the var log journal directory, and then you can do nice things like show me the log from the previous boot, which is minus one. And then you see it's an older one. And you can also um, ask it, like, which boots do you know about? So I created this VM in August 13, apparently, and the one from August 21, 18 o'clock, that's the, the current boot. And you can also combine all these. So you can say, give me the messages from user thousand from current boot, which belong to, I know, I don't know, GVFS service, for example. So there was loads of options. Uh, the man page documents them very well. And a nice, nice property is that you don't really need to worry about like block rotation or the thing overflowing your disk. So by default, it uses a dy dynamic size constraint. So I think 10% of available RAM or disk depending on whether you use temporary or permanent journal. So it actually adjusts to the space that you have available. And, you it, don't and it makes sure that uh, if you have less than 15% of your sp disk space left, then it also starts uh, returning away uh, old messages. Right. Instantly, yeah. So you keep about as much data as makes sense on your system without uh, well, eating your disk, but you don't need to decide in advance, like I want to keep the first, uh, the, the last, seven days of log data. Of course you can change the configuration, so do like a, the old time-based approach, but usually the defaults are fine. <coughs> and if you want to, to see even more stuff in the journal, you can also apply the debug build, uh, boot option, and then the, the output gets really, really big. You can see all the individual state transitions, what systemd thinks should happen now, what, it wa what it's waiting on, what the, the job statuses, statuses are. But you can also, <coughs> if, you are on the, if you already have booted the machine and you don't want to get the, the large robustity for everything, is there 10 minutes left? 
Really? Wow, okay. I thought we had 45 minutes. 45 oh. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions up to this point? All right. So there is also the possibility to dynamically change the, the log level. So you can, uh, no, da, ever tried typing in front of an audience? <laughs> so you can dynamically change it. And from then on, if you do something like uh, cron, for example, then you see that you get, oops, yeah. Use minus F. Yeah. For example, you see it, it shows you the, 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 the command that it was executing and the pit file and whatnot. So that's, that might be helpful in some cases. And now I want to show you some typical problems that can happen uh, when, like, when you, for example, install a new package and it installs uh, a new service on your system which hooks into early boot which is somehow messed up, which is, I think, where it becomes interesting for you as a package maintainer. So. We now try to boot this. You see, there's not really that much going on. And that's bad, right? Because, like, there was no terminal and, ah, okay. And now we finally got some error message. By the way, uh, the usual timeout for systemd is 90 seconds, uh, which means like if uh, you say this service has to be started on boot and it somehow fails to start, then after 90 seconds, systemd will usually show you that error message. Uh, for the purposes of the demo, I changed that to 10 seconds. <coughs> okay, but still this is early boot, so no VTs, what do we do? <laughs> so let's hit the reset button. So pretty much, hey, there's my keyboard. Hello, keyboard. <laughs> ah, okay. So pretty much the first thing you should do is drop the quiet so that you see a little more what's going on. And then the pretty much most invaluable debugging tool that we have is the debug shell, which you can enable with uh, giving the kernel the, uh, the systemd.debug shell option. Oops, no. And if you, so this will start a root shell on VT9, which is done very, very early in the boot and it survives until the bitter end. So it's pretty much always available un unless there is something really, really bad going on. So you see, we, we I just uh, hit out of nine. So we see uh, we have a nice shell now. Unfortunately, there's still a bug in systemd which uh, clobbers your debug shell with the common debug messages, but yeah. That will be fixed at some point. So we can check. Oh, I figured you couldn't read this, right? Uh, that's bad. <laughs> Hang on, let's see whether, is this any better? No, uh, how did you? And, yeah. Oh, okay, I don't, can't really increase the font size at this point, right? Uh, okay, so let's, let's try to explain and show less. So at least I, I can say I have a debug shell here and I can do all the system cripple or any kind of introspection commands that I want. So if I type system cripple this jobs, I see uh, a list of running jobs and this one, for example, says blocker.service, which is type start and state running. So I see blocker service is running and it keeps being running and uh, that seems to, 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 to block everything because everything else is just in state waiting. So I could now go and introspect what this thing is doing. For example, if I type system cripple cat blocker service, I see that in XX start this is just doing a sleep 2000 and apparently not going anywhere. So now I could go and kill that job or fix that job. But um, so list jobs is the first thing which you can can see to uh, which you can do to see what is currently hanging. <coughs> uh, 
Well, I guess I show you the status at L in the running system so that you can actually see something. Okay, let's forecast this here. <laughs> so one thing you need to be aware of uh, about the debug shell is that it gives you a root shell without a password query. So you shouldn't enable that option uh, in your grub default configuration. You sh really should do that and only enable that on demand. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is, yeah, sorry? Well, it's of course off. So this is this is why before when I didn't boot the TMP debug shell, you have no VT on the system because the the blocker dot service, if you could have read it, uh, it is a very early uh, service which wants to boot in the equivalent of RTS dot D. So it it runs way before like disks are like around the time when disks are being mounted, and way before there is get keys and all the fancy stuff. <coughs> So another trap which uh, seems to be a common pitfall is if you have a broken FS tab. That is, if FS tab mentions some device which isn't there or cannot be mounted. Uh, I mentioned this on my talk yesterday. Uh, so sys5init and upstart just happily ignore these situations, but systemd is m stricter about this because in some cases it's, it's really, really wrong and the system behaves in a weird way or even in an insecure way if you forgot to forget to mount uh, something which you really want. So for example, oops, we have a couple of mounts here. Can you read this now? Yeah. <coughs> and for example, we could break the U the UI uh, the UID of var which is here let's make this into an A okay a common a common problem is that users reformat their swap space so it yeah. changes the UID a uh, UID and uh, that that seems to happen quite often and if we now boot this we will see that again it takes a while because uh, like in a hot plug system it might be that swap uh, eventually appears, but no, it doesn't. We see here timed out waiting. Well, well, I see it says timed out waiting for device dev disks by UUID blah 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 uh, dot device. And if that happens, then you will get oh, this is bad. <laughs> so I get a root shell here, which essentially says welcome to emergency mode. And in that root shell again, I can investigate what's wrong. And well, I guess that's a little point of showing that here, but that gives you a rescue shell before everything is mounted. And you can again inspect system cripple list jobs or system cripple dash dash fail to see the failed unit. Oh, actually not. <laughs> Oof, okay. Well, you could look into the journal again and then you see um, uh, could be some swap. Where is it? Okay, ignore this. So, <laughs> um, so you can uh, you get the root shell and you can hack into the system and fix the UIDs or fix FS tabs and so on. <coughs> Sorry, quick question. Yeah, please. I have one question. I had uh, something like this with a CentOS seven machine that I um, changed the. Uh, booting with slash boot to a label in FSTAP, but forget, forgot to set the label. And I had it there that um, systemd would not start, would time out at uh, 90 seconds and then drop me into a shell. Mm -hmm. And it, I didn't get a network, so I had to use an out of band management to get onto the machine. And it was, uh, didn't start the SSH daemon because the mount was not there. Right. Now the mount isn't quite that important for a normal operation of the machine. How is this handled in Debian? I think one has to add no file to the uh, no fail to the FS tab to make it non-important. But how is it in Debian that um, is uh, starting of the network or um, of the SSH daemon possible in that state, or wouldn't it be possible? Well, it really depends. I mean, if you're slash user or slash var fails, then I'd say you don't really get very far. If it's some slash media amount or just where you keep home directories, of course you could get far enough. 
I mean, this idea came up before that if you are dropped into rescue shell and you, you do um, use that server remotely via SSH, that the rescue mode should sh should start your network and start SSH and let you log in. Mm -hmm. But um, it's hard to do that in a generic way. I guess you could uh, hack that on your local server and, and provide something like that. But I'm not sure if you can do that in a generic way and provide that. Because yeah. we, we don't really know what kind of networking system the user is using. And uh, if he's using NetWRD, if up down, network manager, whatever. And um, so it could be a bit hard to, to, to provide that uh, out of the box. But right. So usually, as you say, like the default is fail, which means that any partition you put into FS tab is required to boot. So that's the kind of default assumption if you tell those in, in anyone anything else. But it's very, it's, it's perfect to main, uh, to mark uh, slash media or, or so partition as no, no fail. In which case, system D will complain, but it will just happily go on. But again, if you do this on slash user or var, uh, you will still get a broken state, but a lot less explicit. So it'll just behave weird or lots of services fail to start up. So yeah, I, I wouldn't put no fail to slash user or slash var. I don't think that yeah. would be a good idea. Uh, what I what I experienced then was that when the boot doesn't uh, when the slash boot wasn't be able to mount it, I tried to start the SSH and it would time out again on the ninety seconds and drop me into the emergency mode again instead of starting uh, out SSH. So in the end, I ma uh, how what I did is type USL bin SSHD to start it manually, and uh, I would. I would like uh, it, it would be able to even in this uh, state of an emergency shell at least start the SSH that's service. That's uh, possible. And uh, what you are seeing is that uh, SSH de uh, declares um, a dependency on uh, its uh, default service using default dependencies. So um, it depends on local FS target. And if you start that and the, this dependency is not yet fulfilled, it will try to it will try that again. But you can use dash dash ignore dependencies, I think, is the switch. And then it will just uh, queue the, uh, the, the job without uh, looking for any dependencies. Thank so you. Yeah. that should work. Right, okay. Another yeah. question from B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you just showed us we have a broken FS tab. We enter in the root shell. Um, so what if I fix the FS tab and want to continue with the boot? Oh, just press Control D. And no, that's actually not sufficient. You need to uh, tell System D to re-parse uh, FS tab. You need to run System CTL oh, daemon reload. reload. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so, sorry, what do I have to run? Daemon daemon reload. You need reload. to do that and tell System D to re-parse at the FS tab. Okay. It doesn't do it. Okay. Or just reboot, of course. But yeah. So at this point, nothing really is mounted yet. So. Well, actually, no. I mean, it could be that your root partition is mounted, so just hitting the power switch is a bit dangerous. But so uh, next, I was actually going to show a boot deadlock and how to debug this. But again, since you can't read this on this beamer, I guess I just skip that part and um, restrict. Like maybe first uh, do the the stuff that I can show in the <coughs> graphical terminal. So, for example. So now boot this, this VM, okay. Uh, then we will notice that it, that it takes significantly longer to boot. So we have quite a long hang here, nothing happens. So it's not like it totally breaks your boot, but something is clearly wrong here. And we want to, to figure out what that is. Uh, okay, 14, make it save. Come on, right. So there is the tool system, uh, the analyze, which is very useful in that. Um, if you just call it like this, it will give you a summary of the, the time that it spends in the kernel and user space. And if you boot this on an EFI system, uh, you will even see the time that it spends in the bootloader. Um, since this is not EFI, it just really can tell the, the, the kernel and not really the time that it spends from powering on the grub. And so that shows us we took 8.1 seconds in user space, which does sound a bit long, and you want to optimize that. So, oops, no. And then we could look at uh, basically the path, the dependency path that is the critical chain that is, if you sum up all the, 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 the weights on this 
long has passed, and we would get up to this 8.1 seconds, and we can see exactly when happened what. So we see that like system the user session, so the system was ready to accept logins at like 0.8 seconds, but then our graphical uh, user uh, or graphical login manager LXDM only started at eight seconds, so something is clearly wrong there. So we could take a look at uh, the list of units, which of those took the longest time, and that's for system D analyze blame. That gives you a, descent, a, lo a list of units in descending order, and this shows us this expensive service took 7.3 seconds to start up. That's, of course, bad. And if you are more like a graphically oriented person, there is also a kind of a poor man's boot chart, which is called, you have a question, sorry? No, no. Okay. Um, uh, there is a poor man's boot chart, which is called system analyze plot, and that will generate you a nice SVG. So, okay. That should look reasonably familiar. Of course, this one doesn't have a lot of details about CPU usage and IO weight and so on because you would actually need to insert some probes which slow it slows down the whole boot. The, the advantage here is that this is always available because you can pull this out of the journal and it, there is no overhead on getting this data on boot. So these just contain the units, no processes. And here we see this expensive service that took like 7.4 seconds to activate and LXD, M service, etc., <coughs> is obviously blocking on those because, can you see this? So only if, only when expensive service uh, stops, then multi-user and our login manager, etc., start. <coughs> and yeah, of course, you now could look into what is this thing actually doing? Uh, expensive servers and so on, and yeah, I just gave it some like lots of number crunching yeah. here. It's not J just an interjection here. Usually uh, on all those commands, uh, tap completion should work if you have tap completion enabled, and that should work for both ZShell and uh, Bash. So, Yeah, that's right. So so it, it knows all the, the, the verbs that these commands have and, and the, the options of those and so and on. And running jobs and that. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, <coughs> as shows you. So. All right. And if you want to drill down into more detail, there's also the like a more classical boot chart available. Yep. How is this information not enough? Uh, it really Ah, that's an interesting so question. You to ask again. Or follow oh yeah, I repeat the question. So how do you see like how do you get like a shutdown chart? And I must say I haven't uh, tried this yet, so I couldn't give you an offhand answer, but it's obviously very interesting. So do you happen to know this? Or? Well, if it takes really long, you could uh, just start a debug shell, switch to TD9 and, and run, uh, for example, C systemctl um, uh, running, for example, to, to right. see which jobs are currently running and blocking. Yeah, I did so have a shutdown hang, but yeah, as I said, I skipped this because it, it's not really that useful to, but to show it on on, on, on this. But as for the actual question, I don't think you can generate plots from the shutdown process, at least not to my yeah. knowledge. Right, yeah. okay. So, and again, where's my keyboard? Okay. So, for, for this scenario, you had to cheat a little bit because for boot chart generation, you actually need a kernel patch. Uh, not a kernel patch, sorry, you need the, the, the Sketch chat scat uh, kernel option enabled, and that's not uh, true on the Debian kernel. So on the Debian kernels, you can't currently produce those deep boot charts. So I installed an Ubuntu kernel in this VM. Uh, you just have to bribe them. So maybe there enable. are some kernel maintainers <laughs> in the room, and it's <laughs> oops, uh, can I visit, run log, look. Demo. Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. So because um, generating a boot chart is actually rather expensive, you actually need to explicitly enable this, as I said. Oops, not that one. <coughs> so you need to boot with the special object, uh, like with a different init binary, which is lib, 
system D, system D, full charge. So you should be reasonably familiar with this from the original boot chart package. Uh, how did you enable that? It was similar. Yeah, you also okay. specify the init equals and then point it to the boot chart binary. I think it was ah, okay. sbin boot chart D or mm. whatever it was called. So takes a little time. There we are. So with this should be uh, much more familiar to you. So you see all the fancy graphs of uh, <coughs> CPU usage and the I.O. utilization with read and write. So you see the, the CPU block here is actually quite nice and compact. So there is not a lot of extra and unnecessary weighting going on. And now you have all the individual processes and you see when they become active and block the disk and so on. So we still see our DD command here, which is from our expensive service. So this took like almost five seconds and this is clearly something which we should optimize here. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, right, so another interesting debugging tool if you somehow can't really get to the machine you, uh, you, you want to debug is a serial console. Um, oops. So on the on the kernel command line option, uh, you can uh, redirect the entire console output to, for example, equals tty as zero. And system D will parse the console equals options and uh, redirect the the console output of the kernel and. Uh, like get these to all of them. I'm not sure if you showed that, that you can also increase the, the debug level on, on the kernel command line with that uh, systemd dot uh, debug uh, log level ah, right. equals uh, debug. So. Mm. And so you see the output not in the VM, but we, we get it outside in the VM on our uh, serial console. And now we can just log in as usual and do stuff. Yeah. That's that's really useful if you have to uh, um, so. investigate shutdown problems where you don't get the journal for all of the shutdown process. Right, or if it's a remote machine and you just have a kind of few CMU KVMs. Question: yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Can you use this if you're giving a talk where the QEMU view is not visible and you can use the serial output in the other terminal to make it visible? The system and the unit and the full container is a kind of a continuum, but yeah, is does it answer your question? Or, all right. Any other questions? Right. Yeah, and you should also be aware that it doesn't provide full isolation, so it's not a replacement for uh, KVM, for example, and so on. Right. So it's so LXE a is a bit better in that regard. But yeah. yeah. I think Leonard called it uh, true on steroids. So, <laughs> so you showed the nice little pretty charts, but a lot of times doesn't necessarily is the best way to look at stuff. For me, is there a way to just get that same data in a log file, like every service that starts, when it started, and when it exited? Yeah, that's that's pretty much what the journal actually is. So the <coughs> can see this. Yeah. Well so in fact, the uh, system the analyze plots or blame everything that that does is really just look into the look into the journal and you see starting starting or start head start head. So you see one when a starting means a particular unit. Uh, was started by system D and then start head means that the exec start or whatever uh, it tries to do has finished and now it's running. So and you see the timestamps here. So you can pull it all out of, of that if you want. Yeah, I just want to wondering if there is just a simpler way to just pull out the service creation exit stop without you know interrupting starting right. started. And and the, and the journal actually also uses uh, micro precision uh, time, uh, yeah. microseconds uh, precision. So if you use another output format, you could actually see the. Right. Oopsie. What was that called like? Uh, Carry on. All written down. Oh, dash over both. So you see, that's really just a database. So there's lots of key value fields here. And this is everything which uh, is contained in the journal. So if you, uh, th there's also 
see what you can filter on and so on. Okay. All right. Next question. Two minutes left, so probably time for one more. Um, just a question. Can you abort the timeout on boot? If if I see there's something wrong, I now it won't get fixed. Do I have to watch it count up the seconds until it until the timeout runs out? Well, I mean, if the timeout runs out, usually boot uh, just tries to go on without that service. Of course, if that's a crucial service, like your, uh, I don't know, uh, the TTYs yeah, or whatnot, missing. or then it doesn't help you a lot. Of course, you could for debug, you can always set the debug shell and stop that unit. So that works. But of course, on the production system, you don't just want to leave it like this. You need to do something to fix the problem. So there is no control C or something to interrupt the unit right now. I and think there is, if you if hit control alt uh, 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 delete uh, backslash, you can uh, restart the, the system without having to wait for the timeouts to. Right, so uh, but I mean, I thought you meant like. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Cancel the current unit no, only. No, that's not possible. And it's not even uh, clear what you mean by current unit. There could be like five units starting all at the same time. So. All right. Well, if you have any further questions, please mail us or talk to us. And uh, do we still have time? Okay. Is there a tool to check out dependency and ordering in uh, system the units when the system comes up? I know you want to be things in parallel, but that's not reality. There are some jobs that ha that have to be ordered. The ordering um, documentation is complex, and sometimes one w one just wants to try whether after and before and once and everything is correct. Okay, that's what I mean. Yeah, so there is a there is a system kernel list dependency. It also has a dash dash reverse. Uh, so which is pretty much, uh, well, I hope it's what you are asking for, if you, I got this all right. So you can tell us, uh, so this tells us which units wait on debug service. And without this, this just tells you what does debug service depend on. And the green and red also tells you whether it's running or or stopped. And also state and also restore are just like one shot units which just execute a command so they're not running. Um, and there is also, what was it? So this is by default shows the required. So dbus uh, starts this other unit and for after and before, there's also a switch. Um, what was it? Dash dash after, yeah, exactly. exactly. So this is not necessarily the same. It looks similar, of course, but before and after are ordering and requires is uh, basically dependency, but without ordering constraints, which makes sense to, uh, yeah, to split. Okay, uh, I think uh, we can all thank you for this very interesting and interesting talk, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, let's have fun. Sure. <laughs> thank you.